Hello. Okay. Uh, in this section, we're going to be talking all about light. Uh, light being one of the most fundamental important things about uh, observational astronomy, uh, because that's where we get almost all of our information um, about astrophysical objects. So we're going to start uh, looking at what exactly is light, um, because it's something we are familiar with in our everyday lives, um, but we want to dig a little deeper into what what it actually is and how we can measure it. So as you already probably know, uh, white light is made up of all the different colors of light combined. So if you put white light through a prism uh, or, or something else that gives it, shows its spectrum, shows you all the colors of the rainbow. Um, so that, that shows you that this, uh, these different kinds of light are all combined into white light. White light, of course, for us, um, is, you know, dominated by sunlight, at least when it's nice out. Um, light is often described as a wave, uh, and there are a couple of uh, terms to keep in mind when looking at a wave. So you could imagine this, if you want to imagine something physical, you can imagine ripples of water in a pond after you toss a stone into it. Um, the height of those waves is the amplitude um, and the distance between two crests or the, the highest points is the wavelength. The frequency is the number of times per second that the wave goes up and down. So if this wave was moving, you could imagine how many times per second does a, you know, if this wave is moving through my hand, does a crest hit my hand? Um, and the speed of the wave is the wavelength times the frequency. So these things, these three things are related. Now light as an electromagnetic wave, meaning that it is made of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, which is hard to imagine, um, but this is one of the surprising and amazing results uh, that came out of studying electro electric fields and magnetic fields is that um, combined they actually make up light. So light, a light wave is a vibration in these fields. Um, and because of its nature this way, um, light interacts with charged particles um, and with electric and magnetic fields in, in interesting ways. So the, for light specifically, uh, light moves at a constant speed. All light in the universe, if it's in a vacuum, moves at the same speed as any other bit of light in the universe. I say in a vacuum because it can slow down a little bit when it's in, um, excuse me, a medium such as air or water. Um, although the speed of light through air is fairly close to the actual speed of light in a vacuum. Um, so we're typically just gonna call it speed of light um, and it's uh, usually denoted with a, a small letter C. Because the speed is a constant, that means there's an interesting relationship between wavelength and frequency. Whereas water waves can have a wide range of, of wavelengths and frequencies and speeds, because light has a single speed, if you change the wavelength, you have to change the frequency. So if the wavelength is big, like the wave that you see at the top of the slide, long wavelength, um, large wavelength, um, large distance between those crests, then its frequency is going to be lower because that red wave, say if that's going through my hand, the crest is gonna hit, you know, you know, at a certain cadence. If you compare that to the purple, say the purple wave is moving into my hand as well, it's moving at the same speed though. So there, it, you're gonna hit more crests per second, basically, it's gonna hit my hand. There's more wiggles per second. Um, and you notice that the wavelength is, is shorter. So these things are inversely related. If you increase the wavelength, you decrease the frequency. If you increase the frequency, you decrease the wavelength. Um, for as far as visible light is concerned, red has the longest wavelength and you go through the whole spectrum down to purple, which has the shortest. Um, and this um, astronomers, you know, tend to 
use both wavelength and frequency to describe the light that they're viewing with. Um, depends on, you know, often it depends on what kind of astronomy you're doing. Like a lot of radio astronomers uh, just, you know, by historical reasoning tend to work in frequency. Um, whereas in optical, you might see a lot more uh, people talking about wavelength. But if you have one, the wavelength or the frequency, you can always find the other one because you know what the speed of light is. Now, we talk a lot about light's wave properties. However, light also acts like a particle. And uh, that particle is called a photon. Um, and so you treat this particle of a photon, this photon as also having a wavelength and a frequency um, and an energy. So the energy of that particle of light depends solely on its frequency. So higher frequency means higher energy. If you go back to the, our colors of the visible spectrum, the highest frequency here is purple. That means that type of light has the highest energy out of these options. Um, don't worry too much about the fact that light is a wave and a particle. It's a super weird, awesome thing uh, that we talk about uh, in physics. Um, but what I want you to be aware that sometimes I'll talk about it as a wave and sometimes I'll talk about it as a photon and they are the same thing. Now, the different types of light, they're ordered by their wavelength and frequency. Uh, the light that we see is the light in the visible spectrum. So it's light with a certain particular particular wavelengths um, of the size of, what do they have there, protozoans, which are, you know, um, like microscopic creatures, but not quite as tiny as bacteria. Um, but that's not the only type of light there is. Uh, radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays are all the same physical phenomenon as visible light. So they're all made of these oscillating electric and magnetic fields, the difference between them is the wavelength and also frequency and energy, um, but they all do move at the same speed. So this uh, chart shows you the uh, frequency and it gives you a wavelength, um, but more interestingly, it shows you things that are about the size of the wavelengths. Um, so gamma rays, um, and, and this is useful because uh, this helps us to understand um, what types of sizes of things these, these waves might interact with. Um, an atomic nucleus, super, super, super unimaginably tiny, uh, is the size of gamma rays. X-rays are useful because they are about the size of atoms, the electrons moving around. Ultraviolet, you might have molecules. Again, visible light, you have these little microscopic organisms. Uh, infrared would be like the tip of a needle. We start to move into microwave and radio, uh, and we start talking about things that are a few centimeters big to things that are several meters big, like buildings. Uh, so there's, there's a wide range here. But it's important to note they're all the same phenomenon. All the same thing, they're all different types of light. And they're useful for astronomy because you can actually see different things using the different types of light. So th these are all images of the same galaxy. This is M31. This is the largest spiral, it's the Andromeda galaxy, the largest spiral galaxy to our galaxy. And in the middle is a fairly familiar picture for those of you who use Mac, because a lot of Macs have that as a default screen, um, screen background. Um, that is what the galaxy looks like in visible light, and it's dominated by stars. So stars give off lots and lots of visible light, um, and so you see that. You also notice some darker bands in there where light is being blocked, it's often being blocked by dust. Not quite the same as dust bunnies under your bed, but along those lines you can think smaller versions of that. Now if you look at the infrared light coming from that galaxy, um, different structures are highlighted. And what that's showing you is if you match it up with the visible light image, the parts that were dark are now glowing because that dust that blocks um, a lot of that visible light is actually radiating light of its own. 
but it's radiating infrared light, mostly, uh, not a lot of visible light or any visible light. You keep moving down to the radio and now you see gas. I don't remember whether, which type of gas this is, whether this is the molecular hydrogen or not, um, or I guess this carbon dioxide. But anyway, uh, it's, it's tracking not the get dust so much, but gas clouds within the galaxy. And with that, um, you, you, it's like totally dark in the middle, right? Which was brighter in all of the other images. If we go to the higher energies, ultraviolet, ultraviolet light is given off by very hot stars, but definitely not all stars. So it looks a lot more sparse. Uh, and the x-ray image looks completely different. There's all of these dots, right? Uh, you don't see the spiral arms anymore and it clusters more inside, uh, in the center. Um, because these sources of x-rays, uh, which I don't want to get too much into now, are kind of um, dotted around the galaxy, but uh, are more concentrated as you get towards the center. So you're seeing different things, different pieces of the galaxy in different types of light. You can look at a nebula that way as well. Um, this is the Crab Nebula, which was left after, left over after an explosion of a massive star. Um, and from left to right, you're seeing it in gamma rays, in x-rays, uh, in optical, and then in infrared. So these are all different space telescopes looking at the same object, uh, looking at the gas and material in different ways. And finally, oh, not finally, um, <laughs> there is uh, the sun. So you can look at the sun in different wavelengths. And we will get into the sun, we will get to the sun in a future um, talk slash chapter. Um, the sun that you're used to seeing is the second one from left. Um, although you should never, ever, 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 ever look at the sun without proper professional gear. Um, if you have a pro proper professional <laughs> uh, solar filter, you might see through your telescope uh, that second circle uh, from the left. Uh, it looks like, I don't know if that's a dot on my screen or an actual sunspot, but we'll go with sunspot. I think it's an actual like darker part on the sun. Um, you may see that uh, as I'm recording this in July 2020, there usually aren't a lot of sunspots. It's really sad, but uh, other times there might actually be sunspots. When you look at the sun in infrared, you see a different layer of the sun. And so you see it looks different. When you look in ultraviolet and x-ray, uh, again, you see different parts of the sun. So you're seeing um, phenomena happen at different wavelengths. And finally, uh, this is actually the same object I showed before, the Crab Nebula. Um, but what I like is this, this does is it adds radio, uh, which is uh, my, my, my favorite. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, radio light uh, from ground-based telescopes along with the infrared and the optical and the x-ray from the different space telescopes. And on the right, it actually puts them together. And so you see different parts of what's happening, including there's like a, something called a neutron star in the middle, there's a disk around it, there's these jets, there's all this gas happening. Um, so they can really um, hone in on the physics of what's happening by bringing all of these together. So to highlight, light is a particle and a wave. Uh, so we'll talk about it in either way. Uh, different types of light on the electromagnetic spectrum have different wavelengths. And from that wavelength, you can get the frequency and the energy, but they all move at the same speed. So light is useful for many things in astronomy. One of those things is uh, figuring out the temperature of objects. Um, so if you take a very deep image of a crowded star field, such as this one from the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the first things you'll notice is that the stars are not all the same color. Some are red, some are blue, some are yellow, some are white. Um, there's a range, some orange, so there's a range of colors in this image. The so stars come in different colors. Um, this is actually giving us an indication of temperature. A more realistic example of something that gives off light that tells us about temperature is a toaster oven or regular toaster or perhaps your oven coils. Every object emits something called thermal radiation. So it gives off light based on its temperature. It gives off a certain amount of light 
at different wavelengths based on that temperature. So something that is, you know, um, this toaster oven as it's warming up, you may notice the coils first are, you know, not giving off light that you can see. Um, then they start to glow dim red and then like brighter red and then orange. Um, they don't usually get above orange, but if you go to something even hotter, uh, you get yellow, you get white. So you can actually see the object, um, its brightness change and its um, color change as you change the temperature. Um, so what we see, so what we can do is compare this, uh, look at these stars. Um, based on this, we uh, know that the hottest stars, so the hottest bluest stars, so here's the catch. This, this fascinated me when I was on like sixth grade. Blue stars are the hot ones and red ones are the cooler ones. Remember how I went from red to orange to yellow to white? If we kept going to hotter temperatures, um, that if metal didn't like melt and destroy itself, you could get to blue. So the hottest stars are blue. The coolest stars are around 3000 Kelvin and the sun, uh, which peaks in about the yellow slash green, but mixed together, it all looks like white light, is about 5,800 Kelvin. Kelvin is a temperature scale. Um, when you're in the thousands, it really not too different. Um, from thinking in, in uh, Celsius. Although in some places in your book, if you're taking this course, um, you're gonna see it have Kelvin and Fahrenheit. So it's uh, a little more realistic. Okay, so I've said we were looking at the color to get an idea of temperature. How do we actually get that? We have to look at something called the spectrum. So all the, uh, let's see, way back when I started talking about light, I showed you that you can split light into a spectrum with a prism or diffraction grading, something like that to make a rainbow. Um, when you do that for a star, you get that colored band on top. So what we see here is a spectrum of a star. Um, you see that it is has most of the colors in its spectrum, but there's like darker bands in it. So we'll talk about where those come from in a second. First thing I wanna talk about is how we plot that spectrum. So <clears throat> we're gonna look at a lot of spectra that look like that colored bar because that's easy for us to picture. However, that's not the most useful way to measure what's actually happening. So if you imagine going through that colored bar and figuring out how bright each and every color is or how bright it is at every wavelength and you make a graph of that wavelength on the x-axis, brightness on the y-axis, you'll get the blue wiggly line that you see below. So that blue wiggly line matches that color bar up, up top. Um, and so the, bot, the lower one is how you'll typically see spectra um, plotted by astronomers because we care about precisely how much light is in each of these colors. Um, so I, I like to say, turn the rainbow on its side and measure its brightness at every wavelength. So to do that, doing that, we um, can look at this theoretical model of thermal radiation. So uh, from, from physics, um, we know that these objects that give off thermal radiation give off thermal radiation according to a specific equation that describes each of these curves. Um, and what we see is that the hotter an object is, two things happen. One thing, so we've got 3000 Kelvin is the coolest one here. 4,000 Kelvin is the green line. And then the hottest is the blue line, 5,000 Kelvin. You can ignore the classical theory one. We're not gonna talk about that. Um, the, the realistic ones are the three in color. So the hotter that an object gets, the more light it gives off. So it's higher on that intensity um, Y axis. Uh, and notice it's higher at every single wavelength. It's not like these, cur these curves never cross each other. It's not like one's high in infrared, one's high in ultraviolet. The hotter it gets, the, the more light it gives off all across the spectrum. However, the peak of the curve, the place where the curve, the, the wavelength where the curve is at giving off the most light 
also changes with temperature. So the 3000 Kelvin curve has a peak around, I don't know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 on that graph. Um, the 4000 Kelvin curve has a peak around 0.75, I guess, and the 5000 Kelvin is closer to 0.5. Um, and that's in a unit of, wave, of wavelength of microns. So hotter objects emit more light at all frequencies per, you know, unit area of the star that you're looking at. They also emit more light or more photons with higher energies. Higher energy now in the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, at least as far as the visible is concerned, means shorter wavelength. So that means it's gonna give off more light on the bluish end, if you're just talking about the visible spectrum, um, than something that's cooler that's going to be uh, give off a lot more red light and look redder. So this goes back to our toaster, <laughs> right? Our toaster started off uh, not giving off any visible light. In fact, it was giving off a significant amount of infrared light because, um, you know, you put your hand carefully near it, you could probably still feel it heating up. Um, if you used an infrared camera to look at it, it would probably be glowing pretty brightly in infrared. As it starts to heat up, you start to pick up um, some more of that red light in the visible spectrum. You know, you pick up some more shorter wavelength, you get kind of orange and then yellow and then white. That 5000 K uh, curve is closest to white light, um, which our example here again from a blacksmith, which is a much hotter metal. Um, it's like white where it's hottest and then yellow where it's less hot and then orange and red and then um, it's not giving off any visible light at all or detectable visible light. So highlights from that. Uh, spectrum can be plotted as wavelength, on the x-axis, intensity on the y-axis. So you want to read those carefully. Um, all objects give off some kind of thermal radiation. Me, you, the computer, the microphone, everything uh, gives off thermal radiation. Um, this thermal radiation, also known in physics as black body radiation, because it was uh, theorized, I believe, um, from uh, as a, a box that is the inside is covered in pitch, which is, you know, dark, 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 uh, pitch black leftover um, coal. Uh, so uh, anyway, historical weird thing. We'll call it thermal radiation. Has that specific shape on that plot. And that shape gives you an idea of the temperature of the object. Hotter objects give off more light overall and have a peak that is further to short wavelengths or high energy parts of the spectrum. So it's kind of easy to remember if you remember short wavelength means high energy because hotter means high energy. So that kind of makes sense, right? If something's hotter, there's going to be more energy in it. Okay. Let's take a closer look at spectra. Um, there are three basic types. Um, if you're studying this, you may hear this called Kirchhoff's Laws of Spectra. Um, and the spectra that we use in astrophysics usually are a combination of these three basic types. So the first type of spectrum is continuous. So this is that straight rainbow um, that you see uh, when you put a, you know, a certain kind of light through a prism, such as an incandescent light bulb, which not a lot of us have around anymore these days. Um, so, but if you put, you know, incandescent light bulb through a prism, you're going to see, you know, anything you get that complete rainbow effect. Um, that's called a continuous spectrum. Uh, that usually comes from a hot, usually sort of solid um, source, giving off thermal radiation. Doesn't always have to be thermal radiation. There are other types of continuous spectrums that are not thermal, but for our purposes, talking about stars, um, thermal radiation is, is the particular example that we're working with. So that, that, that curve that we saw, that thermal radiation curve uh, is a continuous spectrum. It's got all the colors in it. Next, you might see something called an emission spectrum. Spectru, awesome. Uh, spelling is cool. Uh, that usually comes from looking at a, a gas that is hotter than its surroundings. And um, you put the light through a prism and instead of seeing all the colors, you only see certain specific colored lines. 
Now, most of us have transitioned from incandescent bulbs, which are wasteful because they give off a lot of infrared light that we're not using, with LEDs, so LED light bulbs, um, which actually have this type of spectrum, this emission spectrum. So if you walk around with a diffraction grating uh, and look at uh, the lights in your house, you're probably likely to see an emission spectrum um, in this case. Another type of spectrum is an absorption spectrum. It's like the, what is that? It's like the, the reverse of the emission spectrum that we just saw. Um, so again, you have gas. This time it's cooler than the hot light source behind it. And what you have happening here is that hot source, which we know creates a continuous spectrum, the light goes through a cool gas, and when it gets to us, some of those colors are missing. So that gas has somehow absorbed or blocked those specific wavelengths. Um, so these be three basic types, you can uh, see them all together. So a hot source gives you a continuum. Hot source going through a gas get, gets you an absorption spectrum. Um, they drew a second gas cloud, but you could actually imagine you're looking at the gas cloud from another angle so that the hot source isn't behind it, and then you just see it against a background that's colder than the gas, so the gas is now the hotter thing, you would see that emission spectrum. So this tells us something is happening here, particularly when you look at the lines in these emission and absorption spectra. You might notice that the bright lines line up with the dark lines. So this is telling us, oh, so when the continuous spectrum goes through the cloud, the dark line some light is removed at specific wavelengths, but it's emitted in different directions because you would see an emission spectrum if you look at that gas cloud from another angle. Some uh, examples of these spectra. Um, this is a, a this is a con I think this is a continuous spectrum. Sometimes it's hard to tell uh, without a little slit if that is continuous or just a whole bunch of emission lines, but. Uh, this was labeled as a continuous spectrum on Flickr when I found it. Um, more obvious are the emission spectra. So these are certain types of light bulbs, right? These are these um, modern light bulbs that have uh, emission lines and not the full rainbow. Um, what's interesting about these patterns of lines is that every atom has its own unique pattern. So we're showing here different atoms, um, different types of atoms, such as Na, which is sodium, um, Ca, which is calcium. Uh, looks like we have magnesium, which is Mg, rubidium. These all have different patterns. Now what they've shown you here is the color background and then like brightened where the lines are. So that's one way of showing an emission spectrum. Um, but each of these atoms has a slightly different pattern of emission lines. What that means is you can take that pattern of emission lines and match it up against the pattern that you see in, say, you know, a gas cloud in space and figure out what it's made of. Uh, for example, a lot of these pictures, these gas cloud pictures, um, uh, this is a black and white photo. Often when people make these in color, they show up pinkish. Uh, turns out that's because this is mostly hydrogen gas and hydrogen emits certain specific wavelengths. Um, a, a red one, a greenish one, and two purplish ones, um, if I'm not mistaken. I guess some people argue whether it's green or teal. But mixed together, uh, those four lines look like pink, <laughs> bright pink. Um, and so the this hydrogen emission um, that you see uh, is... Uh, the, the, sorry, this uh, light that you see, this gas, is giving off hydrogen light. Hydrogen, giving off an emission spectrum from hydrogen. Uh, an absorption spectrum, like I said, that is missing some of the lines. This is a very, very, very detailed spectrum of the sun, our sun, our star, um, where obviously it starts at the top left, and it's so long, it's stretched out so much that they've just, you know, continued... Uh, each bar going down. Um, and what you see are a lot of little and some large um, dark lines, places where light is missing. 
So that tells us we're looking at an absorption spectrum. There is a hot, dense object going through uh, it, its light going through a cooler cloud. Um, what's physically happening here is the, the core, the interior of the sun is hot and dense and giving off continuous um, spectrum of light. But the outer atmosphere of the sun, since it's a big ball of gas, um, the outer atmosphere is a bit cooler and less dense and the atoms in that atmosphere will absorb some of the wavelengths um, of light before it actually reaches us, uh, even before it goes through the Earth's atmosphere. It's going to come to us as an absorption spectrum. Okay, so the highlights here. Dense objects give off a continuous spectrum. Diffuse gases give off an emission spectrum when they're hotter than the background. And a continuous spectrum goes through a diffuse gas, seen, that should be seen through a few diffuse gas, makes an absorption spectrum. Ta-da! Um, so these three types of spectra are all related. Um, you can kind of relate them all to the same objects. Okay, so uh, what do spectra tell us about atoms? Um, I've shown that different types of materials, different types of atoms, have different emission and absorption spectra. They have their own, each atom has its own fingerprint. Why is that? We've got to go back to a very simplified model of an atom where you have, uh, this is uh, specifically has a, um, a nucleus in the center. It's positively charged, usually has uh, one proton would be hydrogen. If it has a bunch more protons and neutrons, it's some other type of atom. And the electrons are these negatively charged things that orbit around the nucleus. Here's the catch. Electrons can't orbit the nucleus at any place it wants to, any distance from that nucleus. It has to orbit one of these specific orbits. So this, um, gets to kind of the roots of quantum physics, which we're not gonna super get into. Um, but these electrons are only allowed to live in certain orbits. So um, electrons can be at the n equals one, n is what, the, what we use to determine the first level, second level, third level, fourth level, um, going outwards like that. So the lowest one is called the ground state, uh, and the ones above it usually are called the excited states. For an electron, to move between levels. Uh, it needs um, to interact with energy. So an electron in a lower level has lower energy. It needs to get energy from somewhere to hop to a higher level. Similarly, when an electron in a higher level drops down to a lower level, it's gonna lose energy. And it's gonna do that by interacting with light. Um, so if uh, th on the left, it's showing you an electron going from a lower level to a higher level, it's going to take light in. It's going to absorb light. If um, the electron starts at a higher level and drops to a lower level, it's going to give off light. It's going to emit light. Um, so these, we can call them photons, we can call them part, bits of light, whatever. Um, this little bit of light is the energy that interacts with the electrons inside the atom. And again, um, so I'm sh I've shown you circular orbits, uh, but we can simplify those pictures just by showing, um, showing them as straight lines going up. The first one is the ground state. Uh, the ones after that, higher than that, sorry, getting texts, um, are the excited states. So the, the higher energy states. Um, and uh, the electrons can't, can only live in these specific levels. You can't just stick an electron between levels. It's got to go from one level to the other. So when you look at each atom, each atom has its own unique set of levels. This, for example, is the are the energy levels of hydrogen. So there's a certain specific amount of energy between the first level and the second level of hydrogen. And that is shown as the I guess that's a blue line all the way over to the left. 
there's a higher amount of energy between the first level and the second level. That shows you the next blue line. Uh, and you can keep going up, you know, theoretically infinitely, but eventually you can get to the point where the electron is free of the atom um, and just leaves. So you can, you can have enough energy to kick the electron out of the atom. Now, uh, those match up with the blue lines on the bar on top. So the bar on top is showing an emission spectrum of hydrogen um, with all of these different wavelengths. Um, the blue ones are in infrared. If you go up one level to the second level, you can see electrons can go between two and three, and that's how you get the leftmost red line. They go between two and four, and that's how you get the next red line, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do that for each level. So each level has its own set or its own series of lines. Hydrogen specifically, um, the ones that are appear red on the screen are the ones that are in the visible light range um, that we can actually see. So if you looked at hydrogen, visible spectrum of hydrogen, this is what you are likely to see. Um, there's a red line and a greenish teal line and then a bluish purple line. And if you're really lucky, you might see the last purple line. I have a lot of trouble seeing that one uh, since it's kind of dim and near the end. But when uh, this is showing us that you have hydrogen somewhere where the electrons are jumping down from different levels, specifically down to level two, because that's where all these, these visible light lines are. Uh, the inverse of that is an absorption spectrum where now the hydrogen gas is absorbing the lights with those specific wavelengths because those specific wavelengths match the specific energy between the energy levels. And then you get an absorption spectrum of hydrogen. Um, and again, to show us how we actually tend to plot these as astronomers. Um, so from the colored stripe, you have a star. Um, the star goes through, the starlight, say, goes through some gas, uh, goes through a spectrograph, which is shown by a prism there, and you get that little thing. Um, this is uh, specifically saying we're just looking at sodium. Um, the colored bar with the black lines is what I've been looking, what I've been showing you. The one below it is more like what we would see in reality. Again, we would measure the brightness of each color, each wavelength. Um, and where we see the dark lines, we would see dips. So absorption lines show up on our spectra as dips. Conversely, emission lines show up as spikes. So that's something good to know. Um, so if you put that into uh, look at actual star spectra. So these star spectra are ordered from the hottest ones at top to the, um, the coolest ones at the bottom. The actual intensity is uh, completely made up here because they just wanted them all to fit on the same plot. But you notice a couple things. One thing is that um, the background, if you ignore the dips, there's like a smooth background. That is from the black body spectrum that uh, we talked about, oh, sorry, the thermal emission spectrum we talked about earlier. It's not super obvious here. Uh, it's more obvious for the coolest one where it's clearly going up beyond the red and the hottest one where it's clearly going up beyond the purple. Um, but somewhere in the middle, you actually have it having the, the most in the middle here. Like I said, they've kind of flattened it out strangely. But that goes along with what we talked about, having that thermal emission when it's hotter, gives off more blue light. Um, and when it's, yeah, it peaks more towards the, the shorter wavelengths. And when it's cooler, it peaks more towards the longer wavelengths. But you also see all of these dips. Um, and the dips change in depth um, with temperature. So, ooh, so we're seeing, so those uh, really strong lines that you see are hydrogen. Um, you see that the strength of that hydrogen line changes with temperature. So this uh, tells us a little bit more about what's happening in the star. Not just that the hydrogen's there, but how much of it is absorbing also tells us temperature information. 
Um, as you get to the cooler stars, you don't see as much hydrogen, you don't see hydrogen lines as much, but you start to see other lines that weren't present before. Um, so you can identify a lot of what's in stars from those absorption spectra. But keep in mind that the temperature is important as well for which things you see. Okay, summarizing that, uh, electrons orbit atoms at specific energy levels. And as the electrons move up or down levels, the atom will either absorb when it moves up or give off when it moves down uh, a little bit of energy in the form of light. And the energy, the size of the energy jump corresponds to the energy of that light, which corresponds to a wavelength. So spectra can tell us some other fun things. Um, one of those things is the speed at which an object is moving because that is affected by something called the Doppler effect. So if you have an object that is giving off waves, giving off light waves, I'm gonna switch to the GIF real quick. Oh, there it is. Do, do, do. Here's our object from lovely folks over at Wikipedia. Um, this is a, an object, you can imagine it's giving off light, and each crest of the light is one of those blue lines. Um, and so it, the first one looks a little funky, but they really should all be the same distance from each other. So it's giving off light at a single wavelength in all directions. Um, awesome. Move that out the way. Now, if you move that object while it's giving off light, you're going to see something funky. So the object is moving now. It's giving off the same wavelength of light that it was when it wasn't moving. But notice that behind it, the wavelength appears longer. And in front of it, the wavelengths are kind of squished and they appear shorter. This is a really good visual demonstration of the Doppler effect. So if you are observing from behind where this red object is moving, you would see wavelengths in its spectrum. They'd all be a little bit longer than they should be. We say it's shifted to the longer end or shifted red, red shifted. Bleh. Um, if you're in front of this thing where it's coming towards you, that is going to be compressed and so it'll have move to the shorter wavelengths or it'll be blue shifted. This does not just happen with light. Uh, this happens with sound too. Uh, my favorite example being uh, Wile E. Coyote, for some reason, makes a whistling sound when he falls off a cliff. Um, and as he's, he's moving away from you, you hear, fun. Um, more realistic example might be a train whistle. Train whistle gives off a specific frequency of sound. And as the train comes towards you, you hear, and it goes past you and it goes um, terrible. I totally encourage you to look at actual YouTube videos of train whistles uh, or listen to <laughs> YouTube videos of train whistles, but that's kind of the kind of the effect I'm trying to get here. Um, so we can hear it with sound in our nearly everyday life, but we see it in light. When we see that happen to a spectrum, uh, say an absorption spectrum, it's gonna look something like this. The notice that uh, the colors between these two spectra line up. Purple is purple, blue is blue, green is green, yellow is yellow, blah, blah, blah. Well, what we see is the wavelengths where we measure the absorption lines are longer or redder than where they should be. So say the top is usually um, the spectrum that you would get for something in a laboratory that's not moving. So you're measuring you know, the correct wavelengths. And then the bottom one would be, say, coming from a star that is moving, because it's red shifted, moving away from you. So you can actually measure the speed of that star, whoops, as it moves away from you. Um, so it tells us whether the object's moving towards or away. That's really useful when you, things are gonna, we're gonna get to some examples where things are in orbit. In this case, you've got a tiny planet that you can't see, because it's too tiny, pulling on a star, uh, and the star is, is going in its own little orbit. So if you watch that star over time, Sometimes it looks red shifted, sometimes it looks blue shifted. So that tells you it's going back and forth somehow. Um, and the best, easiest way to get something to go back and forth is that, that orbit. 
So for highlights for that, uh, the Doppler effect shows us uh, how we can measure speed of something moving away or towards us, not across our line of sight. Um, it measures the speed only, not the distance to the object, not the color of the object. Um, the Doppler shift itself doesn't tell us what it's made of. It's just telling you the speed. Even though we talk about redshift and blue shift, it doesn't tell us what the intrinsic color of the object is. Uh, and since you have hung on this long through one of the longer of the mini lectures, uh, you should say hi to Macy. Oh wait, no, this is the wrong camera. There she goes, Macy. <gasps> That's Macy. Hi. And behind her is Luna. Uh, those are the dogs you occasionally hear in my recordings. Um, and Macy is also the unofficial mascot of our Society of Physics Students chapter. So, all right, that's it on light. That's a whole lot to cover. Um, we will uh, talk about how we detect that light in the next one.